I don't think there's any right way to do anything, to be perfectly honest with you, and I wish that somebody had told me that earlier in life. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier. Hi, my name is Morgan Kibbe, and I'm going to be talking to you today about a cue from my score for the British film Mothering Sunday, uh, directed by Eva Husson. It was based on a Graham Swift novel. Mothering Sunday follows Jane from post-World War I all the way to today. Um, we see her fall in love twice. It's two beautiful love affairs, but more to the point, the story is about her um, self-realization as a writer. When I first started working with Ava, it was on her first film many years ago. We've been working together ever since on everything she's done, so we have a deep um, uh, language between us. And uh, when we first set out to start working on this particular score, it was very important to us uh, to honor the fact that it was a period piece, but also the fact that it spans many decades. So how do we achieve that? Uh, musically, what's the palette? And then it was also to find a way to really reflect within the music the physicality, the sensuality of not only the story but of Eva's filmmaking and kind of the physical geometry of how that works uh, and, and is, I suppose, mirrored in, in the music. So I'm going to play a cue called The Waves. Okay, so this cue is actually, spoiler alert, it's at the end of the movie. It's not the very end, but it's close enough. Um, and Jane just finds out that uh, Paul has died. Ava was really clear with me that she wanted to keep it, I think, um, pretty simple. Not too many thematic uh, elements being brought in. Um, so, uh, and also wanted to make sure that we had an element that would add propulsion as Jane makes this decision to kind of pull herself together. So there is a uh, piano, there are a bunch of solo uh, viola and violin stuff that Rob, who was my collaborator on this film, uh, recorded and I layered and kind of arranged. And, um, and then an alto flute, and so we'll listen to kind of the first two elements, which is Rob and the piano. So we really wanted to keep it simple at the top. There are two elements that we're looking at here. Uh, there is her need to pull herself together and the physicality of her grief, which is, you know, you think of like waves of nausea. They just kind of, they, they float. Um, we talked a lot about this idea that right after a tragedy, um, you're not necessarily in your full grief yet. You're kind of spiraling. So the strings are really kind of sitting on top and just kind of, very slowly kind of moving at their own pace um, across a very kind of almost quantized uh, propulsive piano. Um, so that kind of gets us into the cue. And then we switch over and start adding in lower orchestral elements as we start to kind of expose what's happened to Paul. So here's where the cellos come in along with, ah yes, the alto flute, which we decided to use over um, a normal concert flute uh, in order to give, I think, like a, a, a warmth and a depth uh, in representing Jane. So here we go. So yeah, the flute is interesting there. Obviously this is, you know, we're listening to the, uh, the MIDI. So um, it, it became much floatier in the final uh, recording, 
but there's kind of a conversation going on between the flute here. Well, there's a lot of dialogue throughout the entire score, a lot of back and forth call and response of instruments, particularly with Rob and the flautist. And um, uh, even though they weren't in the same room together. So we kind of have the flute here doing its thing. It's kind of sparkling. And then we also have Rob, which if I can get to him, <laughs> he's kind of replying. So there's a lot of just kind of highs, lows. And I think that that was really important. It's this feeling of ping-ponging around emotionally within the experience of this death. So I obviously can't talk about this score or this cue without talking about my main collaborator, uh, Rob Moose, who did all of the solo uh, violin and violas. Um, but aside from one cue that was truly a solo line, uh, he did a lot of really, really interesting layering um, of bizarre techniques that, uh, as he was explaining to me, uh, most people would frown upon doing, whether it was on the violin or the viola. And I was like, yes, that's where we want to go for this. Um, and it, we had some really great conversations about, uh, once again, physicality. What does it feel like? Um, and uh, I got to speak to him in terms that weren't technical and say, I want X, Y, Z. I want electricity. I want, I want it to feel like this, that, the other. And, um, and we would kind of dive into that. So. With this particular cue, it was that sense of falling, this, uh, this idea of one hand uh, kind of moving on to the other, or handing off to the other, uh, and what does that feel like? What frequencies are we covering within that seesaw of dialogue within the strings that he was doing? So it starts off with this lovely line. You know, you even have the two strings going like this. So you have one ascending and one descending. Then um, he did this beautiful line. I'll talk about it after we listen to it um, as we're discovering the car burning. So I just think the way, there's a couple things about that, just even that particular moment within the cue that I just, it just moves me, um, is that not only are we covering kind of a spectrum of frequencies just within what he's doing, uh, but it almost feels like a sigh, it feels like a cry. It's, it's the, it really hit, I think, that physical note that we were looking for. And just to add, this was the first cue that we, did that I sent to Ava and it felt like we found the film. So it was uh, a very, a good, a good cue to find a reflection of the physicality. Um, and then the thing about the cellos that's interesting is that they really only come in when we're punctuating specific moments on screen. Um, and we did that on purpose. Obviously, you know, that lower frequency is gonna ground us within the storytelling. Um, and so this is, this is them. really not more complicated than that, but somehow not getting that low with anything else until those crucial moments where we're, we're understanding as an audience what happened, it's sometimes the smallest thing at the right moment that helps tell the story within the music without being, hopefully, too bombastic <laughs> or too on the nose, um, which is always my fear. And I really try to, I try to pull back. It's like less is more, less is more. The foundation of this cue was the piano. That's where I started writing it, and that's how it ends. Um, and really getting, I think, the, the chord structure right was very challenging. But strangely enough, um, yes, it's about grief, but there is a lot of floaty kind of major moments within the arrangement. 
um, which is mirrored as well in a later cue uh, with uh, Mrs. Niven and Jane, um, where you think it's going to be really heavy, but it's it, it almost feels like it's uplifting you above the experience of darkness. Um, I don't think there's any right way to do anything, to be perfectly honest with you, and I wish that somebody had told me that earlier in life. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier. Um, so I recorded the piano as two parts, and I was trying to find propulsion that then led to finding these notes that ended up feeling thematic, and I really felt like we needed that kind of low end to flesh out the chords, and then it was just a lot of happy accidents, to be honest with you, that kind of led me to go, ooh, this feels right. So we'll solo them so we can kind of hear them together and then one at a time. So that's interesting to me because I feel feel like, yes, we're starting off with Jane and, once again, her sadness, her realization that her, lo her, her lover has died. But as we're kind of almost floating in to picture, to understand what's happened uh, to Paul, it felt very natural to me. It's like an oh moment, you know? <laughs> it's hard to explain otherwise, but she has to accept something. And I think that that's what's so beautiful about the story of Jane is that there's this resilience in her. So now we'll listen to them separately. So I think I started, I started with the top part of the piano. Um, so we'll start kind of where we were just were. So yeah, so there's not really, you know, one distinct melody. I think almost even in that top part, the the repetition almost becomes a theme in and of itself. Um, and then the lower part is really just kind of, I think, adding emotionally to me, it adds gravitas and it, and it, and it grounds uh, what the top end is doing on the piano. And um, I am not a good enough piano player anymore to do both at the same time, if that's even physically possible. Who knows? Uh, so this is the lower part. <laughs> I'm sure you can hear it. There is a little bit of a reference to Satie there. Um, this is a British film, but it's a French filmmaker. And um, that was obviously a, a composer that was referenced by Eva early on. She really loves Satie. And we were just trying to find little moments to kind of bring that in. So just in the way that it was played even, I think I was just instinctively approaching it that way. Um, but yeah, those, so those two become one. We discover that he's been in this car crash and uh, we pop back over to Jane's full realization that her lover is gone, essentially. And, um, you know, this is an, it's always interesting to score things that have no dialogue because there's a lot of pressure. It can be very challenging. You don't want to overscore something, um, which I'm always terrified of doing, so I'm always trying to pull things back. Um, but it also gives a huge opportunity where one thematic element uh, used hopefully correctly can have just such a huge emotional effect. So that's kind of where we land with her.
So I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, I had asked Rob to kind of give me some really weird, just scrubby type things. <laughs> Very technical term, obviously. Um, and he sent me these really cool stacks and it just made so much sense as we, you know, you can just see her in the car. She's just sitting there and you just see her panicking. Like it's, it's, it's brutal. Um, and I really felt like these, these things right here that he gave us as we're looking at her face, it just communicates that perfectly. I just fell in love with how he was articulating it. And then um, Warren, our, my mixer and longtime collaborator, the way that he mixed those across the speakers, it, it, it just makes you feel like you're in the swirl of her head, which I think was frankly one of the ways for us to bring the score a bit of modernity was in the approach of how we were mixing the strings. You know, we didn't want to just kind of put them where they're supposed to be. So that is uh, The Waves from Mothering Sunday. Thank you very much for listening to me struggle with how to tell you how I make music, but I'm um, very happy to be here to do so. And there are a bunch of other videos up at Spitfire Audio Academy as well. And uh, Mothering Sunday you can find on streaming platforms if you want to watch the movie and the soundtrack is on Spotify. Thank you.